everyone. Welcome to session eight of the SCTS Foundation Doctor Academy. Uh, my name is Hanad, I'm the course director, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome Ms. Hannah Jasani, who's an ST3 at New Cross Hospital in the West Midlands. And tonight she's going to be talking to us about the importance of chest radiograph interpretation and go through some SHO on call scenarios, which will be relevant to many of us in foundation training, but also ST1 and ST2 trainees. Over to you, Ms. Jasani. Hi there, thank you, Hanan. Yeah, as Hanan said, I'm, I'm Hanan Jasani. I'm one of the ST3s uh, working in the West Midlands Deanery. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking today about chest radiograph interpretation and some on-call SHO scenarios. And I want the session to be as interactive as possible. Um, so everybody, if they're able to switch on their videos and switch on their microphones, um, as in when uh, we can go through some uh, interactive questions and get everyone involved makes it more fun then and more enjoyable rather than staring at black screens. <laughs> and no, no question is a stupid question and um, it's, it, it makes it more enjoyable to go through it that way. Okay, so to go through some of the learning outcomes that um, we hope to gain via this session, we should be able to, after this session, be able to systematically assess and interpret some chest radiograph imaging in relation to cardiothoracic pathology, uh, identify abnormalities in chest X-ray imaging, and their initial management, and gain some knowledge of assessment investigations and management of common clinical scenarios we may find uh, when faced on call uh, as a cardiothoracic SHO when managing the wards. Okay, so first going on to chest X-ray interpretation. Um, we tend to always use a systematic approach, and in medicine in general, we always seem to use an A to E approach in everything that we do. Um, so in this sense, we always look at um, other approaches can be used as well, um, but it's whatever suits you, okay? The most important thing to remember when we look at looking at chest x-rays and interpreting them is making sure that we always have the right, right patient details. Um, that's looking at the name, the date of birth, and the hospital number, the date of the image, and exactly where the image was taken, if it was an AP or a PA film. I'll go on to discuss about how systematic approaches with A to E later on. Okay, so some of the reasons that we obtain a preoperative chest X-ray uh, include things like checking for missed underlying pathologies, both being in the thoracic cavity, looking at the pleura, uh, looking at the lungs, uh, and looking at the mediastinum as well. Um, if a patient attends for surgery preoperatively with new symptoms being shortness of breath, uh, cough, hemoptysis, evidence of pyrexia, and it's also important that we gain a preoperative image in order to compare when we have postoperative imaging as well. Okay. When we look at chest x-ray imaging, we always need to assess the quality of the image as well to see if the image that we have, we can really gain as much information from as possible. And in that sense, we use the acronym right. Again, other people can use different acronyms and, and ways of doing that. Um, but I tend to use this way. Uh, first of all, assessing rotation. Uh, we assess rotation uh, by looking at the brony prominences, essentially, of the, of the thorax, um, which includes looking at the clavicles to see if they're aligned uh, and looking at the spinal processes to see if they're also aligned. Looking at the inspiration, meaning has the patient been able to take a good inspired breath um, so we can look at the full area of the lung also looking at the apices of the lung and looking at the crossophrenic angles do we have the whole imaging of the whole thoracic cavity looking at the projection as i've mentioned is it a anterior posterior or posterior anterior view um, obviously i'll go to talk about the reasons why this is important for us and looking at the exposure essentially how bright the imaging is and we can change these on uh, most likely on PACS um, imaging systems that we use in hospitals to help us gain a bit more information. Okay, so interpreting an image uh, and being systematic with this using the A to E approach. As I've said and mentioned, it's always important, most important thing is to make sure we don't have the wrong patient and we're not looking at an image from one year ago or a week ago, and we're looking at the correct image that we want to look at. Um, it, that's an important thing. I know it sounds silly to keep on repeating it, but it is important and things sometimes can get missed. First of all, A, 
is looking at airway, looking at the trachea to see if it's centrally placed, looking at the carina, uh, looking at the main bronchi as well as the hyla structures. Um, obviously, a deviation of the trachea uh, can, can be uh, signs of clinical pathology. Uh, tracheal deviation away, uh, causing a mediastinal shift, can be a sign of tension in the thorax. And towards um, could be a sign of pathology caused by a large pleural effusion or collapse of the lung. B, I tend to look at breathing, or we can look at bones as well. So breathing, meaning the lung fields, uh, looking all the way up to the peripheral of the lungs to look up flight to the pleura. Is there any signs of focal consolidation? Uh, is there any patchy op opacifications? Um, and looking at the bones as well, looking at clavicles, and you can also look at ribs as well, and you can comment if there's any fractured ribs too. C is looking at the cardiac shadow. I will go on to discuss this later. Uh, and D, looking at the costodiaphragmatic angles, essentially looking at the base of the lungs to see if they're easily visible. And E is for everything else, any paraphernalia of anything like ECG leads, uh, nasogastric tubes, uh, endotracheal placements, um, any chest drains in situ, um, any lines in situ as well um, that you, you should always comment on. Um, and you may be asked to also uh, check uh, things like uh, you know, CBC placements and things like that um, after they've been put into. Okay. That's a systematic approach of looking through a chest x-ray and I'll now go through um, each one of those um, variables to, um, to go through any difference in pathologies um, with some imaging as well. This is a chest x-ray with normal features and normal, uh, normal image. Um, as we can see, we're looking at the trachea here, starting by the trachea with the airway, looking at the lungs with breathing, looking all the way up to the pleura to see if there's lung markings all the way to the peripheral of the pleura, uh, looking at the hyla structures as well, uh, looking at the bones, see if there's any evidence of any fractures. This looks like there's no rotation as the clavicles are aligned and the spinous processes are also aligned. Looking at the cardiac shadow, which appears normal, and the costodiaphragmatic angles as well. So you can see the right hemidiaphragm is slightly more raised than the left hemidiaphragm. There's clear costophrenic angles. Um, yeah, so that's an image of a, a normal, a normal X-ray. Okay, and we always remember that uh, air is radiolucent, meaning that it doesn't absorb the X-ray radiation, uh, whereas uh, radio opaque um, things like fluid and soft tissue absorb less radiation than uh, things like metal. So that's why they show up brighter than uh, than fluid and soft tissues. And air, you can't air doesn't show up anything at all. Okay. So our first case here, and again, everyone, I'd like to switch on your microphones if you'd like to speak. Um, so first, first chest text stream is here. We've got JB. He's a 20-year-old male. Uh, he was presented to A&E with sudden onset shortness of breath. He's got a very minimal past medical history. has no drug allergies and no regular medications. Does anyone want to tell me what you think is going on in this imaging? And if you want to... <laughs> and if you want to um, uh, describe the imaging to me, so not just the clinical diagnosis, but if you just describe the chest x-ray to me. Does anyone want to speak up on the microphone? Hi, Hannah. Hi. Hi. It looks like um, airway-wise, there's deviation of the trachea towards the right, right lung, lung field. There, there's yeah. lots of lung markings on the left lung field as well. Mm -hmm. So this would suggest something of a tension pneumothorax with this clinical picture. Sure, excellent. Yeah, well done, Calvin. So you've gone through a really nice systematic way, going through the airway and the breathing there. Well done. Um, don't forget always, I've got here the, the, the patient's name, the age, um, the fact that it's an AP portable x-ray is also important as well. Um, being important wise, because he's obviously been very unwell requiring a portable chest x-ray in ED, uh, and it's an AP view too. But yeah, well done. So you've gone straight to uh, the trachea moving, uh, deviating away, mediastinal shift, and there's a large pneumothorax there on the left-hand side. Um, can you also see here, guys, that there's also an evidence of a very flattened hemidiaphragm on the left, um, the tracheal shifting, 
And can anyone tell me why um, in a tension, what is the difference between a tension pneumothorax and a normal pneumothorax? Hello. Hello, it's Tara. Oh, hi, Tara. Hello. Nice to see you. I don't want to answer because I don't want to jump in on all the others, but I don't <laughs> want you to sit there with silence. So I'm going to say to your colleagues that are on here, come on, guys, we know the answer to this. Speak up. <laughs> so I've got people speaking on the chat. That's fine, Mustafa. So Mustafa saying, um, one way valve uh, can't escape. Okay, so it's essentially a tension pneumothorax. It essentially means the essentially the air is tensing and it's pushing the mediastinum away from the area where the pneumothorax is. And the reason that you become uh, hemodynamically unstable with this is because when you have the mediastinum pushed, the inferior vena cava, which brings blood from the uh, inferior portion of the body, essentially it tenses up against the diaphragm and reduces blood flow back to the heart. And that's why you get a reduced uh, cardiac output and a hemodynamically unstable state. So this, essentially, this uh, chest X-ray uh, is very dangerous, evidently. It shouldn't really been taken because um, a tension pneumothorax is a, a very uh, uh, important clinical diagnosis to be made prior to gaining any, any further investigations and should be decompressed immediately. So yeah, but Mustafa, that essentially, that's essentially kind of what, you, what you've said there. So well done. Thank you. So as I point out here, the large pneumothorax, mediastinal shifting, the tree is deviated away, and you've also got a, a flattened left hemidiaphragm there. Well done. Thank you, Calvin. Okay. So we'll go on to breathing. Uh, essentially, as I said, we check the lung field, check up with the pleura. We check for lung markings all the way up to the peripherals. As we've shown in that previous x-ray, you couldn't see lung markings up to the uh, peripheries of the, of the lung. Uh, consolidation, which is focal areas of haziness. Um, and it's always important to describe, again, if the changes are in the right lung or the left lung, uh, and what zones of the lung are, um, are affected as well. And zones of the lung, uh, in, make sure you include the apices as well. So we talk about the upper, middle, lower zones, and the apices of the lung too. That's why it's important that we always see the whole of the thoracic cavity in the image. Okay. So again, with the clinical scenario, um, so we've got uh, an 88 year old man here. Uh, he presented to uh, our trauma center uh, with a, a fall at home. Um, uh, initial trauma CT scan showed that there were multiple rib fractures, um, which we've done in ED. And he's been uh, sitting on the ward for a few days. We've been giving him some pain relief um, and he's under the cardiothoracic team. Um, can anyone tell me what, what people think about this chest X-ray? Anybody? Well, I mean, the x-ray doesn't look great quality. Um, I mean, we don't know if it's AP or PA, but airway-wise looks looks fine. Uh, I think it's the it's a, an AP uh, portable chest x-ray there. Sorry, the, um, the caption is just covering it. Oh, we're in the next one. Sorry, one second. There we are. So there is some what looks like consolidation on the right, right lung base. You can't see the claustrophobic angle really. Um, heart might be enlarged, but you can't comment on the AP. So, yeah. So, why do you say that the chest X-ray images is not adequate, Calvin? That's that's great that you commented on that. How come? It looks overexposed to me. Um, mm -hmm. Can't really see. You know, it's too bright. You can't see that much with it. Okay, and also, can you see the patient's, um, the patient's obviously quite a frail 80-year-old gentleman, and he's quite slunched over with his, with his head covering the apices of the lung. 
and also covering the top of the area, the trachea as well. So that's another thing that you can comment on to say that it's not an adequate um, chest X-ray image because we can't really see the full uh, areas of the lungs right at the top there. But yeah, that's good. So you've commented on this area here of, um, of kind of a focal opacification. That's right. And there's bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angles as well. And you're right to comment that it's a AP view, um, so you can't really comment on the on the uh, size of the cardiac shadow itself. But I would say that there's, if I was to present this X-ray, this is a an AP view portable chest X-ray of this 88 year old gentleman. Um, there's a focal opacification on the right lower, well I'd say middle and lower zone of the right lung, uh, with areas of uh, collapse as well on the um, on the on the right base. Okay. okay, going on to the next image, but well done, Calvin, that was, that was good. You picked up on the um, most pertinent things there. And as you can see, 88 year old man, rib fractures, it's important to uh, make sure they're able to clear their secretions um, and uh, start antibiotics soon if you think that they're brewing some sort of infection here. He was obviously unable to clear his, um, his airways because uh, of the pain as well and um, developed a, a right side of pneumonia there. Okay, and we've gone to talk about cardiac shadow now. So um, the cardiac shadow um, is a measure of the uh, shadow of the, um, of the heart on the x-ray. And it always should be commented on a, a PA view rather than AP view. And that's because in an AP view, the heart is sat closer to the x-ray image uh, and could falsely look larger. Um, and it should be less than half of the whole uh, thoracic cavity ratio as shown here by these orange and blue lines. Um, and that's measuring the, measuring the cardiac shadow. So when you describe a, an enlarged cardiac shadow, it's important to, you, don't, you, you won't be able to describe if it's actually cardiomegaly, but you may be able to des describe that there is an enlarged cardiac shadow because you don't know what that could be. It could be fluid in the pericardium. It could be an enlarged actual cardiac muscle. Um, so it's important that we need further imaging. And looking at now the costodiaphragmatic angles. So again, if someone could comment, um, maybe someone else apart from Calvin, you've done really well. Um, we've got a patient which is two days post-op following a coronary artery bypass surgery. What do you what do you think of this this chest X-ray? Um, hi. So starting with the airway, it yeah. seems all sort of central. Mm -hmm. The trachea seems sort of central. Yeah. So in terms of costodiaphragmatic angles in the left side, I couldn't pick the costodiaphragmatic angle. And, and I assume that there are some fluids which makes radio opaque in the lower part of the left. Apart from that, I can choose four sternotomy. Um, stitches that I can see in the midline. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the cost of diaphragmatic angle on the right side, I could choose the angle. So it, I cannot say that it's full of uh, fluids or something like that. Sure. Excellent. So you've gone, you've gone to the most obvious um, abnormality here, which is this uh, blunted uh, left cost of diaphragmatic angle. And we can see that there's a meniscus level here. Um, so it's an um, indication of a left-sided pleural effusion. Um, this patient's also got a, a blunted right costophrenic angle as well. Um, so this could indicate signs of overload as well as a, a left pleural effusion as well. And I, and I know that this is, I appreciate it's, a, it's an AP um, image, so we can't really comment on the cardiac shadow size. But I would say that there is a degree of a wider mediastinum here. Um, and depending on a uh, patient's, hemodynamic stability and things like that may warrant us doing further investigation to see if he's having a, a collection in mediastinum as well as this left-sided uh, moderate effusion as well. But yeah, that's that's good. Well done. Um, um, you've really gone through that nice and systematically there. Good. Okay. And ease for everything else. Um, so going through here, can anybody spot any um, any any um, external things or internal things on, on this image? Uh, 
Yeah. So the obvious is the sternal wires. Yes, good. And then is that an aortic valve, metallic valve or mitral? I'm not sure. Excellent. Yeah, you spotted here. So you spotted a metallic valve. And why do you say it's metallic? Because it's really opaque. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, exactly. It's really opaque. And we'll come across um, some prosthetic um, uh, tissue valves in a moment because they do look like different shapes as well. So brilliant. So those, those two things you spotted there nicely. And here, we'll go over quickly NG uh, tube placements. Can anybody tell me... Um, a few things about NG tube placements that we need to comment on um, when looking at them on a chest X-ray. Is it below the diaphragm or not? Is there a gastric bubble or? It's more past the carina and below the diaphragm. Excellent. Yeah, those those two things. So, does it bisect the carina? Meaning, does it go through where the two main bronchi come out? Goes underneath the diaphragm. And it should be about 10 centimeters below the diaphragm, ideally. So as you can see here, we should comment on all these three things. And it's important in, in everyone's health board, um, I'm sure the rule is now that you must get a, a radiologist report of the chest x-ray prior to um, feeding the patient um, if the NG tube is used for feeding. Um, but these are things you, you may be able to make a quick assessment um, of uh, prior to knowing that the, the NG tube is not usable. Um, prior to asking the radiologist. Okay. So bisecting the carina, meaning going past the bifurcation with the main bronchus uh, underneath the diaphragm. And the NG tip, NG chip should be clearly visible. So uh, an inadequate image would be if the tip wasn't shown, so you couldn't comment on that and you couldn't use that. Okay, and this is also another x-ray with lots of things going on. Can anybody tell me what they can see in this x-ray? There's lots of things going on, so whatever you say. The um, central line. Yes. So this is the central line here, this is the CDC. Yeah. Pacing wires. Um, is it not? You, you can't really see pacing wires there, no, no. Although I suppose this, I mean, this this could be some evidence of pacing wires attached at the external part. Anything else? Has there been a prosthetic valve replacement? There has been a prosthetic valve replacement here, yes. So you can see this is different to the valve that we saw earlier. And there's also a ring as well behind it. And we'll go on to talk about that in a second. Yep, yeah, so that's... That's two kind of valve rep uh, repair and replacements here. Yeah, anything else? I was wondering if there's any plexuses or collapse in the right lung. In the right, as in this area here. Yeah. I yeah. think I think it's more that we've I think it's more that it's overexposed. Um, but yeah, there could be evidence of some athlexis maybe in the in the middle zone here. Okay. Uh, can you everyone see the the mediastinal drains here? as well. Um, so it's important when, when we're looking at x-rays of, of chest drains, um, that when we're looking at them, we're always looking to see these areas of where the holes are in the chest drains. It's important that they make sure that they stay inside the chest cavity. Um, when you're commenting on um, chest x-rays post chest drain insertion, making sure that the hole isn't outside um, the chest cavity and placed in the subcutaneous tissues, because obviously that could cause um, air to enter the subcutaneous tissues and give you a false air leak. Everyone can see the sternal wires here. Um, this is another uh, line, um, uh, PA catheter. Uh, this is a PIC line as well here. Can you see that here? What's a PA catheter? A PA catheter is a, a PA catheter um, used which floats into the essentially goes where the CVC line is, the central line is, gets floated into the internal jugular vein, uh, into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, up to the pulmonary artery, and thereby it measures the pulmonary arterial pressures. So you use that preoperatively and also postoperatively. Thank you. No problem. 
can't think we've got anything else in here. I'm sure we've got lots of things here. Oh, yes, and we've got the ET tube as well. Obviously, it's important to make sure that that's a, a good level. So this is obviously a patient um, unwell uh, in intensive care. So as you can see, we can see the difference quite nicely with this prosthetic um, tissue aortic valve replacement here. Um, first of all, it's less radio opaque, uh, and also it's got these prongs here, and they indicate the direction of the blood flow. Okay, uh, and here, uh, just below that, you've got the mitral valve uh, annuloplasty ring as well. And these are also monitoring leads too. Okay, so lots of things to see in that one. Okay, uh, and we've got another imaging here. This is a, a patient who underwent a complex procedure. Um, he underwent a, a pulmonary valve replacement and a tricuspid valve replacement um, and a, uh, a pacemaker insertion as well at the same time because um, he went into complete heart block. Um, he was admitted with worsening shortness of breath uh, to clinic. Um, what do you guys think of this chest x-ray here? And what can you see is the obvious uh, changes here? It's a fluid level, is there in the right Yeah, exactly. There's a fluid level. And it's a very, it's not, it's not a um, it's not like a meniscal fluid level that we saw before with the um, effusion, is it? It's a very flattened line. And do you know what that could be um, indicative of? Is that indicative of a hydropneumothorax? That's right, yeah. So it's where uh, air um, is pressing on the fluid level. So essentially there's a, a hydropneumothorax, essentially air and fluid uh, in that right side of the chest as well. And as you can see here, this patient's got a, a permanent pacemaker and um, you can't see very well just because of the penetration, but there's two leads coming down here, um, which means a dual chamber pacemaker, pacing the atria and the ventricle too. Okay. Oh, and you can see the uh, pulmonary valve replacement there with the prongs coming up. Okay, but that's quite a, 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 an obvious sign of, of a hydropneumothorax. It's where you have that really flattened line rather than the meniscal level as, as we saw before. Okay, uh, and this is a, a chest x-ray, which um, uh, one of the team got referred from a patient in one of the peripheral hospitals um, having presented with a, with a pneumothorax. Um, but there was something strange about the, the drain placement. Um, uh, can anybody tell me what, what, is, what you find is a bit strange about this, this drain? It's something that I've just talked about kind of recently. In the same triangle, it doesn't look like it is in the same triangle, is it? The, the triangle at the top? No, the way the, um, the drain is inserted. It's quite low, isn't it? I don't know. It, it, it definitely is quite low insertion on the area of the chest cavity. Yeah, it's almost at that level of the, of the diaphragm here. Um, but essentially, when we look at the chest drain tubing, is there anything strange about it? Is the drain inserted the other way round? That's right, yeah, Jeremy. So, it, yeah, so it's, uh, um, I, I don't know how this happened, but um, the drain tip, which is the end of the drain, which we normally cut off and attach to the rocket bottle tubing or the, or the medulla drain, um, has been inserted into the, into the chest cavity. And, and it, you can only not see it on just here, but when I was saying about checking for the holes in the area of the tubing to make sure they're in the chest cavity, you can see here that there's no holes in the chest drain. So they've inserted it upside down essentially and probably um, in, introduced um, a worsening problem for this pneumothorax on, on that left side of the chest. So that was a, um, a very um, worrying chest x-ray to receive. And a patient's obviously very unwell, uh, had a chest x-ray in recess. It's an AP erect view. So that's why I put that one up just because it's a, a very abnormal um, chest x-ray and important just to check about the, the drain placement. When we're looking at drain placements and we're commenting on them, we're, we want to see that the, the chest tubing is essentially secured well inside the chest. 
Um, is the drain placed basally or is it placed apically? Obviously, if there's air, it's best to place the drain apically. If it's uh, fluid, meaning um, a blood or effusion, um, it's best to place the drain uh, basally, obviously, as gravity. Um, so, yeah, those are the important I just things. make a comment as well, just... Tara. Just, I can remember coming on because you want to make it practical. This, didn't you? Um, I, I can remember coming on shift, and um, one of the junior doctors being quite concerned that there was such a big air leak on the patient. And part of their sort of standard tests, I said, "Oh, have you checked that there isn't a hole outside the chest?" And they said, "No, there hadn't." And they went to look, and exactly reiterating your point, not for the drain going in the wrong way round, but actually there were there was a hole outside. And although the patient hadn't developed massive emphysema or anything, you know, they'd been worried all night. And I think it's it's nice to get rid of the simple things, isn't it, first that you could um, highlight. Definitely, definitely. Definitely, that's a really good point. So that you don't think there's a massive air leak going on when actually you're just having a false reading and the train probably just needs to have another drain inserted. Okay, so that's great. So that's me going through um, kind of half the time on um, on just general uh, interesting uh, chest radiographs and going through some clinical scenarios. But now I'm just going to go through. Um, I've got about four clinical scenarios, and again, want to make it as practical and as as interactive as possible. So guys, get involved, and and we'll go through some of these ones. This is for scenarios on the ward. So common scenarios that we face um, often um, as an SHO on a cardiothoracic ward, um, uh, cardiac scenarios, very common post-op arrhythmias, post-operative infections, uh, temperature spikes on the ward, uh, hypoxias, desaturations, a uh, low urine output, uh, a low blood pressure, as well as a high BP as well, uh, agitation, delirium, pain control post-operatively as well. Some of the thoracic scenarios, and we're going to go through some of these as well uh, now. Uh, lung collapse, mucus plugs and secretions, um, different types of chest strains and how they're managed, pneumothorax, post-operative air leaks, um, what to do when a chest strain disconnects, uh, worsening surgical emphysema, excessive chest drainage, again, post-op pain control, which is very important in these patients, hypoxia, hypercapnia, again, delirium, uh, pyrexia, hypotension, and, and low urine output. So some of these cases we'll, we'll discuss now. So scenario one, uh, you are the cardiothoracic SHO on call um, covering the ward, and the nurse bleeps you uh, with very minimal information. She just says the patient is tachycardic. Um, uh, her heart rate is going, his heart rate is going 135 beats a minute. Uh, can you review the patient now, please? Uh, what do you what do you do? What do you what can you say to the nurse on the phone to help you and to help the situation? Do you think? Go and see the patient. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it's really important that obviously you're going to prioritize this patient and go and see them as soon as possible. Um, but what can you say to the nurse on the phone to maybe help you in that sense? Because all, all the only information that we have at the moment is we've got a patient on the ward who's tachycardic 135. What else do you want to know? What else can the nurses do to help us before yeah. we get there? Because we may it may be that we're, we're assessing somebody else or um, another patient is unwell. Full set of obs in this situation health. Yes, excellent, yeah. So can you please get a full set of observations? How is the patient? Uh, can you give me a very brief history of the phone? You know, do I need to go and see the patient like, urgently right now? Is the patient completely unstable? Or, you know, can I, can I, is there time for you to get a full set of and a 12 ECG before I get there? Excellent. So just ask a little bit more information. And sometimes in some places, the nurse will be able to uh, get IV access and also take blood tests for you as well. Sometimes, obviously, that's not the case, but it's important to ask um, because it can save time as well for the patient. So obviously, full set of and a 12 ECG is the most pertinent thing. Great. So you arrive on the ward. And you review this 65 year old gentleman is two days following coronary artery bypass surgery with three grafts. He was transferred and stepped down from ICU today. His past medical history includes hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. He's had a previous end STEMI, and we've got preserved ejection fraction of 60%. The repeated observations that you've asked for is his heart rate is going about 130 to 140 beats a minute. His blood pressure is 100 systolic over 85. 
respirate 20, saturation of 96% on room air is apyrexial. So the 12 lead ECG that you've ordered comes up here. And just to give it a little bit of time to have a look at this ECG and, and see what you think. Describe it to me. Looks like AF, doesn't it? That's right. So you can see here that the um, QRS complexes are irregular. And there's no obvious P waves here as well. Okay, so you're quite right. So it's it's atrial fibrillation, but also a fast atrial fibrillation. Um, so obviously you count the big squares and divide it 300 by the big squares. Okay, great. So we've got a patient who's essentially gone into fast atrial fibrillation following coronary artery bypass surgery. He's been stepped down from ITU today. He's come back to the ward. Okay, so what are you going to do now? Um, replace electrolyte first. So yeah, great, Alice. So we're going on to that in a moment. That's brilliant. So electrolytes is a really important thing to think about. That's great. Um, so we haven't done a full uh, assessment of the patient yet. We've only got the observations and we've got the ECG kind of given to us. So the next thing, the next thing we're going to do is do a full A to E assessment of the patient. Okay. And um, definitely electrolytes. That's that's brilliant. We'll go on to that in a second. So full clinical examination. A to E, systematic approach. Is the patient stable or unstable? If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, obviously you're going to want to escalate this very quickly. Um, the patient will need a, a cardioversion electrically and, and will need an anesthetic support and most likely to call your senior at this point too. If the patient is stable, we can continue with our assessment and make sure we're being systematic as we do so. Okay. So go through our assessment. Um, I'm going to go through each, each of the um, A to B uh, and see what you think. So airway, the patient is sat up in bed talking to you. He's feeling some discomfort around the sternal wound sites and does feel palpitations, struggling to catch his breath, breath with these palpitations. So there, he's sat up, he's able to communicate with you, um, complaining of some pain. Saturations are stable on room air. Uh, you assess the uh, chest, and there's equal air expansion, um, slight reduction at both bases. He's not really able to take a good deep breath in because of the pain in his sternum. Again, we, we've talked about uh, the circulation. So he's tachycardic, um, fast AF. Fitter refill is, is normal at two seconds. Blood pressure is 100 systolic. Is, uh, don't forget glucose, uh, BM is normal at eight, GCS is 15, and he's orientated. He's passing adequate volumes of urine. Fortunately, we can't measure it properly because his catheter has been taken out this morning um, and also his chest strains have been removed earlier today. But he's, he said to you he's been passing urine. What, what does everyone think what is adequate urine output? Or what should we, what should we look at um, for the patient to have an adequate urine output? If we're able to monitor the patient's urine with the catheter... <laughs> An hour, Sorry, Mustafa, I couldn't hear you there. an hour. Okay, so it, it's, it's just based it's on the patient. Yeah. yeah, it's based on the patient's weight, but yes, exactly. So ideally, it's going to be more than 0 0.5 mil, uh, mils per kilogram per hour. Um, so you want that. Uh, that's, a, that's a good, adequate volume of urine output. Okay, good. Um, so quickly, I've shown the next slide, but we've also we talked about uh, electrolyte disturbance as being one of the causes of, of post-operative um, atrial fibrillation. What are the two electrolytes that we, we must look at when we look at um, taking blood tests, particularly if we need to uh, replace them? We have comments in the chat saying potassium and magnesium. Yeah, yeah excellent. I, sorry, I can't see the chat coming up. Um, yeah, excellent. Potassium, magnesium. So with uh, cardiothoracic patients, we, we often aim for potassium levels about 4.5 and magnesium levels should ideally be more than one. So if, if they are low, we tend to replace them either with oral things like sand decay for potassium, or we can give intravenous as well and, and magnesium intravenously as well. Great. Other things that can cause um, or risk factors for postoperative AF? Does anyone have any ideas? 
Yeah, and then you might drive it to an infection. Infection, excellent. Yeah, most commonly uh, chest infection, but any infection, obviously. Dehydration as well is another important thing. So it's always uh, making sure that we replace things that have been lost. Uh, things like hypoxia as well. Um, and risk factors are things like uh, coronary artery disease um, and uh, preoperative arrhythmias as well. So obviously preoperative AF. Um, so these are all the things that we need to be looking for. So top three things, electrolyte disturbances, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, dehydration. Um, that's why I'm talking about make sure we review the input and output charts. Um, infections postoperatively, uh, most commonly uh, pneumonias, urine tract infections, wound infections, uh, hypoxia as well. Okay. And um, it's important patients um, should, if they're on beta blockers already, they should have their preoperative dose of beta blocker because it has been proven to be uh, prophylactic of postoperative um, atrial fibrillation. The, the highest incidence of postoperative uh, AF uh, is on day two post-op. And it's important that we always correct the underlying cause, like Allah said, with the electrolyte disturbance straight away. Brilliant. So a very common scenario. Um, and then there's options of cardioversion, so cardioversion the patient back into a sinus rhythm. And what are the options of cardioversion that we know about? So it's electrical or pharmacological, exactly. So electrical being, uh, as you talk about, a, a synchronized uh, DC cardioversion. Obviously, we'll need anesthetic support, um, whether this gets done in the theater or the anesthetic room. Um, and um, uh, the pharmacological options as well. And it's always important to discuss what options there are with a senior as well, um, rate and rhythm control. What medications are people aware most commonly used uh, to treat um, kind of fast atrial fibrillation in, in these sense, in these, these situations? Bisoprolol, uh, amiodarone, digoxin. Yeah, by, exactly those three. <laughs> Bisoprolol, amiodarone, and digoxin. Um, there are obviously reasons why we use different um, different ones of those medications for certain reasons. Obviously, the first one we mentioned, so IV amiodarone. Amiodarone uh, works by blocking potassium uh, channels. It essentially, it prolongs the action potential um, of, the, um, of the heart cycle, which prolongs the, um, the cardiac potential. So therefore, um, it's important that a patient doesn't have um, a widening QRS because um, it can cause um, a long QT. So it's important to look at ECGs prior to choosing these medications. That's why um, it's important to assess which ones we should use. Um, amiodarone intravenously needs to be given centrally. So it can be used if the patient has a central line. Um, it may need a central line insertion um, by the um, anesthetist if we need to give this medication intravenously. Uh, and we give this, first of all, 300 milligrams in the first hour and then 900 milligrams in the next 23 hours to give essentially a dose of 1.2 grams over the, over the first 24 hours. And then we can reduce that to oral amiodarone. If a patient hasn't got central IV access, we can load them with oral amiodarone, which essentially is uh, given as, a, as 400 milligrams three times a day. And you make sure you taper down the, um, the um, dosage. Does anyone know what other problems amiodarone can cause? Long term, if it was given, it can cause thyroid problems, um, yeah. liver problems. Yes. Yeah, no. exactly. Yes, so it can cause pulmonary fibrosis, um, liver abnormalities, as well as um, thyroid thyroid problems as well. Yeah, excellent. Sometimes we check those levels before we start the medication. Um, uh, a beta blocker, bisoprolol, is also another option. Uh, some people are very careful when using amiodarone and, and bisoprolol together um, as well because of the risk of heart block um, with those two medications being used together. Um, bisoprolol can also um, cause um, a drop in blood pressure, so sometimes looking at how stable the patient is prior to giving that. And digoxin as well needs to be adequately loaded um, some people give tape, uh, different doses, but 500 micrograms, then giving another 500 micrograms um, can adequately load a patient with a droxin. So those are a few options that we could, we could start thinking about uh, and asking our, our seniors which one we would, we would opt for. Okay. Okay.
So then that, that concludes our first scenario. Well done, guys. Move on to the, the next scenario. Now we've got uh, some time. Um, so the next scenario is you're called to the cardiothoracic ward. You've got a patient desaturating. This patient's a 72-year-old male with a past medical history of COPD, hypertension. He was admitted following a fall with uncomplicated multiple rib fractures and was admitted to the uh, cardiothoracic team for analgesia uh, and conservative management. The saturations are currently 87%. The nurses have applied oxygen and want you to review the patient. What do you do? I'd probably like the nurse to give me a full set of observations and then proceed to do an AD examination on the patient. Brilliant, excellent. And um, so you go in and you take a A to E thorough examination of the patient. Uh, and this is the situation. So you go and talk to the patient. His airway is patent. He's able to speak in full sentences, but he's struggling to take deep breaths and he's slumped in bed. Um, and he's coughing quite a lot as well. Um, assessing his chest, there's quite noisy crepitations bilaterally. Uh, as an experienced wheeze, and there were definitely reduced air entry on the right side. Uh, the patient's got a productive cough. His blood pressure is stable, 110 over 70. Paid a refill, less than two seconds. His heart rate, bit tachycardic, 96, but it's regular. GCS is normal and, and blood sugar is normal too. He's got a good urine output and he's not um, had a chest strain incited because the rib fractures were uncomplicated. So what do you want to do now? What investigations would you like? Uh, blood test and chest x-ray. Yeah, what blood test would you like? Maybe G. Probably. Yeah, full, full bloods, including an arterial blood gas, and you want to be able to assess um, the oxygenation as well if he's retaining any CO2 with his past medical history of CPD2. Excellent. So order an urgent portal chest x-ray on the ward. Okay. So this is the results that you uh, obtain. Anybody want to describe what we see on the uh, chest x-ray and, and the gas? Complete whiteout the right lung. Yeah, going straight to the point. Yeah, there's whiteout the right <laughs> lung. <laughs> um, um, that's great. Uh, what What do you think about the airway? The, the, sorry, the uh, trachea is deviated. Um, yeah, the trachea is deviated towards the right side. The fusion, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. The mucus point, I believe this is. Looks like it. What's possible? What are your other differentials? A large occasion. Um, Possible. Collapse. Yep, so you said, so that's lung collapses, same as plugging, but yes, yep. And it's got a top taste for the So one of the other differential, the patient could have, could have a massive hemothorax. That's a possible, so it's a white out of the right side of the chest, possible. Um, but our clinical examination should kind of point us in the direction of, of what we're most likely thinking. And what does everyone think about the, um, the gas as well? So it could help us rule out some of the differentials. Up to the Sorry, I couldn't hear that. So it's type two respiratory failure, I, I thought. Why, why do we, why do Sorry, we type one, type one, type one, apologies. Type one, type one, yeah. So the patient has actually got a, a relatively normal pH, slightly on the low side, um, but he's hypoxic, isn't he? He's, he's just got a low PO2, um, bearing in mind he is on 40% oxygen, he's on five liters. Um, he's not actually retaining CO2, so, so um, he's not, in type two respiratory failures in, in, in type one hypoxia. Lactate is, is okay on that gas, uh, slight, slightly up. We should, on a arterial gas, it's above one, uh, slightly abnormal. Uh, venous is above two, it's abnormal. 
and the hemoglobin on there is, is also a normal level, um, 130. So that points us away from an from a option that he could be bleeding. Okay. So we've gone through the options and what, what does everyone think the most likely with the clinical findings um, from our clinical examination? And the chest X-ray as well as the gas. I think it's collapsed. <laughs> yes, so uh, a right-sided collapse, right side of white out of the chest. And we've gone through, we've talked about the differentials and talked about the ABG. Um, and if we go with the, the uh, most likely option of, of a, of a right-sided lung collapse with mucus plugging and secretions, what would the treatment be? What would you then do? As you're the SHO on call, what would you do? Chest physio would be helpful. Definitely, chest physio. Often they have on-call chest physio teams at night time as well, so we can call them. Uh, to come and see the patient. Brilliant. Yeah. Anything else? I think if physio fails, uh, he probably need a bronc. Yeah. So he, he's looking like he's going towards needing a bronch, uh, a bronchoscopy, looking at the airways and fully clearing the mucus secretions um, to help inflate that lung. Anything else that we can make sure that he has written up for him and treatment wise before we get ready for his bronch? Can give the usual nebulizers and things, uh, cover systems. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So we've got all the nebulizers. So salbutamol, ipitropium, and saline nebulizers for clearance, nucleotics, carbocysteine regularly. Chest physiotherapy, as I said, we can call the uncall chest physio team, they're very helpful. Uh, making sure the patient's been using incentive spirometer. Um, I've got a uh, picture of just what, what one of those looks like here, essentially to help inflate the lungs. Optimize the patient's analgesia, that's really important as well, making sure the patient isn't in too much pain, that he's able to cough and also clear his chest. And it's obviously important, as we said, to escalate. This patient should be kept nil by mouth, um, to arrange for a bronchoscopy uh, to clear the airways. Um, he may need some ventilator support, some CPAP um, as well, which could also help. Um, but doing the bronchoscopy uh, and preparing for that would be very useful. They may even put a, a mini tracheostomy in to help um, after the bronchoscopy to help clear his secretions as well after that, particularly because of the known past medical history that he's got. Real, so that was scenario two. Okay, we've got some time for the last two clinical scenarios. So third clinical scenario, you're called by the nurse on the cardiothoracic ward. There's a patient, he's day seven post tissue aortic valve replacement for severe aortic stenosis and coronary artery bypass graft times two. His past medical history, he's got a very high BMI. He's got diabetes type two. He's a previous smoker, hypertension. He's had a temperature spike on the ward at 38.2. You've asked the nurse to take a full set of observations and you review the patient. And I'll quickly go to this now. So on review, you're talking to the patient and he's able to respond back to you. The airway is patent. There's bilateral air entry with uh, relatively normal saturations on room air. Um, the nurses have applied uh, two liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. His blood pressure is stable, 125 systolic. His heart rate is 95. Um, and he's had, looking at the charts, he's had two previous temperature spikes actually above 38. But you've only been made aware of this one now. Um, you don't know what's been done um, earlier about the other ones. His GCS is stable. His BM is, is raised. Um, he's known to have a bit of poorly controlled diabetes. Um, his chest drains have been removed a few days ago. Uh, there's a catheter in situ because he's a uh, failed uh, trial without catheters times two. He's got a normal uh, urine output for his weight. So what, what are we wanting to do in the immediate sense? With, with the uh, initial assessment. What's our next step? I'm really sorry, I can't see the chat. Um, if anybody can read out what is in the chat or... Nothing in the chat yet. Okay. I think I'd be worried about sepsis, so maybe starting with sepsis six. 
Excellent. Yeah, I'd no, never forget the sepsis six. That that's great. So what what's involved in the sepsis six? So first, I would reinsert a cat. Uh, uh, oh, he's got a catheter already. So monitor your output. Great. Take, yeah. Take, uh, take blood cultures and give fluids, uh, antibiotics. And he's on oxygen already, but maybe he needs to be increased on his nasal cannula. Possible. Yeah. And anything else we take from take from this three given three take, isn't it? Yeah. A lactate. Yeah, lactate as well. Do an ABG yeah, as well and chest X-ray. Yes, all, all of those things, definitely. So perform a full septic screen. Remember, always never forget your sepsis six. So this is a, a sepsis six, but plus a little bit more. So chest x-ray, urine dip, um, full blood tests, including inflammatory markers, blood culture, venous blood gas for lactate, sputum sample, start IV fluids um, if necessary. Uh, make sure you do a thorough wound examination and send swabs um, and start appropriate antibiotics if you find anything in your initial assessment. But make sure you sent off those samples and the blood culture prior to starting these and a catheter if, if already needed to monitor urine output. Okay. So in these things, so we, we go and we've done, a, we've done a initial examination of the patient, but we haven't fully looked at the... Um, the surgical wound sites. And you go and assess the, the, the wound sites. Uh, the median stenotomy wound, you've removed all the dressings and there's some erythema and some permanent discharge in the mid uh, sternal area uh, with tracking spreading erythema. It's important that you assess the, the sternum for sternal stability as well. You palpate the, the sternum and it, it generally feels, feels stable to you. Um, the, but there is a palpable underlying collection and purulent discharge using from the sternal wound. You look at the right uh, open venous harvest site, and there is also some erythema, but no signs of, of discharge. So what are you thinking now? What's going on? What, what should we do? Yeah, it's very likely, well, it could be surgical site infection. Yeah. So you want to send those discharges to the lab. Uh, and it depends on how much discharge uh, you're going to get. You might want to open the wound. Yes. But it all depends on how much come up. Yeah, so exactly. So you definitely want to send um, samples for uh, MCNS to the lab. Um, most likely we want to send the samples prior to starting any antibiotics so we don't mask anything that we grow. So that's good. So you want to expose the wound properly. You want to, you want to see how deep the wound is going as well. And it depends how comfortable you are, but looking to see if this is a subcutaneous wound or there's evidence that this wound is going deeper and, and be a bit more worrying. Okay, but we definitely know that this is um, essentially a, a, a sternal wound infection. Uh, post median stenotomy. So you've gone through taking wound swabs and the MCNS, starting empirical IV antibiotics. Um, make sure this patient's already spiked temperatures, so we need to start them on some antibiotics. Uh, make sure we escalate these patients early to senior. These may need uh, a, a sternal wound debridement to see how deep the wound is going. Uh, we may need to put a negative pressure, which would have a vac dressing on. Those should be done in sterile techniques in theatre. Um, if the sternum is, is unstable, um, they benefit from having a sternal brace um, fitted for them. And as I said, it's very important to recognise these patients early on. We could see from his past medical history that he's essentially a high risk for um, a wound infections postoperatively, high BMI, uh, diabetic with poor control, um, and um, therefore we should recognise that we need to act quickly if this happens. Um, if there's a worry that this patient has a, a deep infection, uh, we should escalate for, for getting further imaging with a, a CT scan to check for any mediastinal collection, mediastinitis, uh, deep mediastinal infections. But these things, these things can happen. It's important as, as SHOs on the ward that, that we would recognise and be able to escalate these as soon as possible. 
And I've just shown a picture here of a, what the VAC dressing is. So this is a negative pressure dressing, uh, Provena dressing that just gets put over the wound in order to, some people put them on uh, prophylactically to help prevent um, buildup of, of, um, of collection on the wound, um, but also may be put on there if there's an infection post-op. And as I said, it's, it's important to make sure we recognize and, and intervene early in these situations. Okay. So, and we've talked about the risk factors, so poorly controlled uh, diabetic, obesity, smoking, poor nutrition, uh, COPD, uh, and operative procedure as well. So if they've harvested the um, bilateral internal mammary arteries, obviously they can provide uh, some blood supply to the sternum for healing. If there's a poor sternal closure technique, um, if there's a prolonged bypass time, um, uh, prolonged ventilation, ITU stay, and uh, re-exploration, um, if need be for bleeding, then the patient is a higher risk for things like sternal wound infection and also sternal dehiscence, which essentially when the sternum, uh, which is joined together, comes apart. And that's um, a very high mortality, so we need to recognise that early and act quickly. Okay, I think there's just enough time for one last scenario. Um, so scenario four, you're called to the cardiothoracic ward HDU area. You've got a 60 year old lady who's uh, had a right bilobectomy today uh, for a lung tumor, which is extending across uh, the upper and middle uh, lobe fissures. She had an upper and middle lobectomy on the right side. She is hypotensive and tachycardic, and the nurses are worried and want you to review her. She's relatively fit and healthy preoperatively, just past medical history of hypertension and asthma. What do you do and um, what investigations would you like? ATV assessment first. Yeah, brilliant ATV assessment. And we go through ATV assessment. So on examination of the airway, it's patent she's responding to, but she's lethargic. She's not as responsive as she was earlier when you went to see her for a post-op review. And she looks pale. Her saturation is 95%. She's on three litres at the moment. And on examination of her chest, there's a reduced air entry on the right-hand side. She is hypotensive, 87 over 60, heart rate is tachycardic, sinus tachycardia on the monitor. Uh, capillary refill time is slightly prolonged at three seconds, and she's very cool peripherally. GCS is normal, blood sugars six. She's got a, a chest drain in situ, and it's drained 300 mils in the last hour. There's no air leak on the medulla drain. And her urine output in the last hour is 15 mils. What does everyone think about what's going on and what's your, what are you mainly concerned about now? What's coming out of the drain would be what's worrying me. Yeah, so what does the drain output look like? So if I tell you it looks, it looks like blood from the drain. It doesn't look hemocerous, it does look like blood. What, what's, what are you mainly concerned of? A hemothorax, who's she's bleeding from postoperative. Yeah, exactly. So my top differential would be she's a postoperative bleed, definitely. Uh, what do you, what do we think about her other observations? She's hemodynamically unstable at the moment. Exactly. Yeah, she is hypotensive. She's tachycardic. Um, she is less responsive which also is telling me that she's not able to kind of perfuse other organs as well. She's pale. What about her urine output? It's very poor. So. Oh, yeah, she's got a reduced urine output. Okay, so all this is pointing towards very concerning that she is having um, an intrathoracic bleed um, the, so last hour, 300 mils is, is a large amount. Um, so more than five mils per kg per hour is very concerning. Um, so what, we, what are we going to do now? Uh, resuscitate and call senior for help. Yeah, yeah. It's important that we obviously escalate early. Um, so resuscitation is important. 
what what investigations are we going to get? Because we have a we have a we we essentially we have an idea what could be going on, but we need investigations as well. What 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 should we do? Probably a chest X-ray in the first instance. Yes. Unless you might need a CT. Um, see where the bleed is. Yeah, and what other investigations? You can get HP. Yeah, yeah, and how are we going to get a very quick hemoglobin? Uh, venous, well, arterial gas. Yeah, so we can do a venous blood gas um, to get a very quick hemoglobin as well as a lactate as well. But ideally, we're going to send all the blood tests, aren't we, as well? So the patient's looking like she's become hemodynamically unstable. She's got intrathoracic losses. The blood is leaking around the chest drain site. So not only has she lost 300 mils in her drain over the last hour, she's also lost um, blood around the oozing through the um, through the site where the chest drain is inserted as well. So she's losing even more. So we've correctly said um, you we do an urgent portal chest X-ray on the ward. That's great. Um, you take bloods urgently, full blood count, coagulation screening, cross-match the patient. Obviously, the patient may need blood prior to going to theatre. Um, venous blood gas provides a quick HB and a lactate as well. Make sure you keep the patient nil by mouth. Alert your senior, start resuscitation if you guys have said. Um, and the patient's looking like they're going back to theatre um, for re-exploration uh, to control the bleeding. Okay. So this is the chest X-ray that we've, we've got from this patient. So as you can see, when we just when we compare the total whiteout of the prior patient uh, and this patient with the difference in the clinical scenarios and the investigations that you've got, um, and the obviously chest strain in situ and the chest strain output, you can see why it would point more towards. Uh, a right-sided uh, hemothorax, right-sided bleed. Okay. So as the VBG is shown, the HB is 69. It was 120 preoperatively, and the lactate is raised as well. So we're, we're very concerned. So it's making sure that the patient is then prepped for, for going back to theatre. So this is a post-operative bleeding scenario. So patient was transfused two units of red cells prior to getting theatre ready. The surgeon was called the anesthetist anesthetic team, uh, the ODP and the theatre teams as well. And the patient was taken back to the urgent to theatre that morning for exploration um, and was controlled and stabilised and returned back to HTU um, that afternoon. Okay, so that was our, our last uh, clinical scenario that, that we've gone through there. So I think we've gone through quite a big range uh, of a different both cardiac and thoracic scenarios as well to give a, a variety of things that that you could face commonly as the cardiothoracic um, SHO on call and what things we should do in the immediate sense um, uh, as well as as escalating um, and alerting seniors as well so that that concludes my my teaching and my talk uh, thank you very much everyone for listening and, and participating it does make it a lot more uh, interactive and, and enjoyable um, when you have uh, people.